Hey Kingsway, it's Jesse. So thankful and grateful that we have the technology to still be able to meet, and I'm so glad that you're here. We've been seeing lots of donations come through Kingsway, lots of diapers and lots of Operation Christmas Child boxes, and I just want to take a moment to thank all of you who have donated. And if you haven't donated and you're interested in joining in some of what God is doing here at Kingsway, I want to point you over to kingswaymo.com slash bring the light for more information. We're going to worship together in just a moment, but before we do, I want to encourage you to take whatever posture you feel necessary. Whether that be dressing up or, or singing out loud as a family or out loud by yourself or, or even in your pajamas, I just want to remind you that we are worshiping in one body and in one spirit. Let's do it. That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see T'was grace that taught my heart My fears relieved How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed My chains are gone I've been set free My God, my sin
there's a place for me I'm a child of God Yes, I am Well, Kingsway, it's, it's always a privilege to be able to meet together, even if it's online, to be one body, one spirit. And I know that as we take time now to take communion, it's something that we could easily blow by or to pretend that it doesn't have significance because we're not in the same room. But I promise to take this together, to remember the body and the blood that was shed, to take the time to focus your heart and your mind, the gift that has been given to you and me, and to let Jesus come back to the forefront to see his sacrifice as something worth remembering and worth putting and turning our minds to. I pray right now that you and I will take the time to do that. If you need to go collect a piece of bread, get a little juice, follow these instructions, pause this video, take communion, either by yourself or with the group you're with, but we're taking it together as a church, even if we're not together. Let's take communion now together. Well, um, it has been an unprecedented year. Crazy. With all the... the this stuff? Yeah. It's unprecedented how many times we've actually heard the word unprecedented. <laughs> Our dream vacation was canceled. You got to keep the job you don't like. <laughs> you know they can see you? But let me tell you all the no's, friends. Um, no going to restaurants, no movie theaters, no movie theater popcorn, no state parks, no going to athletic events, no church services, and no... Don't say it. Don't. Hey, kids! You've got to be more careful with the toilet paper! This is all we have! All the drive-by birthday parties, graduations, <laughs> baby showers. I will say this, I felt a little awkward throwing out that baby shower gift into the front yard. You weren't supposed to do that. It just feels like a wasted year. I said it, I said it. Yeah, there's, there's just all the time at home. Boom! And all the time that we were made to spend together. Hey, honey! Honey! Leave me alone! All the heart-to-hearts. Mm. Goodness. Speaking of hearts, our son, Jason, right over there said yes to Jesus. Right at that kitchen table. July 17th, 2020. You know, I guess it's not really wasted time because God didn't waste a moment of it. <laughs> I think I have the answer to what I'm thankful for. Yeah? Yeah. What is it? Everything. Well, hey, Kingsway, thanks so much again for being here. I'm excited to continue our Bring the Light series. Again, I know you've heard this already, but thank you, thank you, thank you for doing and being a part of this action plan to bring the light of Christ into this world by our good deeds, glorifying God, glorifying his name. You guys have been doing amazing. We dropped off Operation Christmas Child Boxes this week. We have seen just donations of diapers and money that is starting to come in for this church project in Africa through Erica Maurice's ministry. Uh, I'm just stoked to see uh, what we're going to do by the end of the month. And it's all because of your generosity, your giving, and your willingness to be a part and to bring the light. So thank you, thank you, thank you. As we continue this series, though, I want, I want to get you excited about uh, how I want to light a fire under you. I want, to, I want you to be excited about continuing this campaign and asking the questions. Maybe you've already given or you're thinking about giving to this. I want this to be something by the end of these few weeks that you are, are seeing yourself taking a step in faith and, and finding your place uh, to donate and to find even a way that's maybe not even in our action plan, but something in your own community, in your neighborhood, in your family, uh, in your little community that you could give and be a light uh, during this time. So 
That being said, week two of Bring the Light, we're still going to focus on the words of Jesus. I know I told you last week that this, this kind of blueness, this kind of shadow had kind of gotten over my life a little bit. And whenever that happens, I try to run to the words of Jesus. And we're going to continue to do that through this whole series. Um, the way that I want to kind of frame up what we're going to talk about today is actually the second passage that I mentioned last week. It's a, it's a passage right in the center of the Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's Matthew chapter 6. But in there, there's just a great way that Jesus kind of exposes what happens when we try to be generous, when we be people that get focused on external things, not our selfish things, the things that matter beyond us, even heavenly things, that there's some things that are attached to it that are important for us to know as we take this journey to try to bring the light and to be generous with the people around us. But that being said, I know that financial things can be a difficult thing to talk about, especially around Thanksgiving, which is coming up, and especially around Christmas, because we do see the limits of what we can do. We do know that we have to be careful in our, and we have to budget well with what we've been given. We can't give a shirt away that we don't have extra or that we don't own. And so I know for many of you, you are looking at your finances and you're saying, and I would love to give, or I would love to do this, or I'd love to be a part of that in a bigger way, but I don't know how you will. Now, I will tell you this. Don't miss next week's because next week's sermon is going to be a little bit more of an encouragement in that direction to say, hey, we're going to try to get you into some specific help, especially at the end of next week, towards personal budgetary finance stuff. But this week, I want you just to let your heart dream a little. I want you to let your heart dream a little, and I want your heart to, to, to desire to give, to want to be generous. And for most of us, that's not a big push, but it's important to, ha- to let that flame kind of grow, to let that be something that maybe gets you a little excited. Now, forever, uh, since I've been here, forever in the sense that I've preached so many messages, and I've been here for now, and I've preached on, in November on money at Kingsway, I think this is my ninth year. And so I, I've done this a few times, and I've said this a lot. Give, save, spend. This has been the way that you're supposed to handle your finances in a godly way, and I think in a smart way, in a wise way. But I always think that most of us tend to think of save and spend as the things that we're supposed to focus on. So let's just say that today I'm just trying to give, give its moment. And so let's do that by looking at the words of Jesus. And I want you to see how generosity plays a role, an important first role, in our, in our walk with finances, in our walk with Jesus. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 through 24, you're going you're gonna to be reminded again of why Jesus says money is very important to get in the right place. This is what it says in Matthew 19. Don't store up, uh, Matthew 6, 19. Don't store up treasures here on earth where moth and, uh, eat them and where rust destroys them and where thieves break in and steal. Store your, your treasures in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. Where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. I love that. And then here's this idea of bring the light, right? Your, your eye is a lamp that provides the light for your whole body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, the whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep is that darkness? The deepest darkness is self-deception. That's basically what Jesus is saying. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, for me, when I hear that, I I recognize that there is a battle for my allegiance inside the money topic. In fact, I would say it like this. Money has the potential to steal your heart away from allegiance and obedience. Your money has the potential to steal your heart away from allegiance and obedience. It, it just, for whatever reason, it's, it's like Gollum. It's like this thing inside of you that naturally just makes you go, my precious, I don't want to let go of this. And you let go of the thing that matters most. Uh, Jane Goodall worked with chimpanzees for years. And uh, her, her research and some of the things we've learned have been uh, very insightful into kind of the natural nature of, of kind of living creatures, but also insightful into the sense that some things that, that these chimpanzees did was more of a barbaric or more of a, 
I would say, a fundamental desire, but it transfers perfectly. And she has an example of this very thing. One time when working with a group of chimpanzees, she brought in an extra bundle of bananas. And what happened was when she brought these bananas in, she offered them to, the, to all, each of the chimpanzees, but the ones that had dominance over the group over this large family of gorilla or of chimpanzees would actually hoard all of the extra bananas and they refused to give the extra bananas to all of the extra chimps. They actually would keep them and what was a family that was fine and getting along all of a sudden with a little extra food began to be dysfunctional and angry and did not get along and fight. And her observation was not unlike the human race, that when there is extra, is multiple, it, it multiplies the problems and in fact, a lot of times creates and has deep-rooted evil and issues inside of it. And when I heard that, I was like, ooh, that is so true, how a family that's dividing up an inheritance, uh, a, a group of people find or have a, a business that does well, um, a child that has the one extra cookie <laughs> that, that now has to be divided up. It, it, for whatever reason, just a little bit of extra, it kind of pulls to the top this issue of what just kind of breaks our allegiance and it breaks kind of our obedience. And if you're truthful with yourself, you know there are many places that this happens. In fact, that's one of my observations of this. Money is the place to find your allegiances. Think about this for a second. Where your money goes is where your heart follows. And where your money goes, and in fact, I've heard it said this way, if you want to know what matters most in your life, check your bank statement. Look at the thing that you spend the most money on. That's the thing that matters most to you. That's what has your allegiance. Now, I just put a couple examples on here. Maybe some of these hit home for you. Sports. I know hunting seasons now. Uh, maybe it's fashion. Uh, there's no comma there, so maybe it's fashion kids. You know, that's it. Maybe it's just your kids itself. How about, how about guns? And I've had some conversations with a couple of you, and I'm like, man, we got an arsenal. If uh, we had a zombie apocalypse, there are a few houses that I'm going to because we'll be just fine. <laughs> I know their allegiance. And it's true. I mean, you can feel this in, in your heart. You can feel that this is true. And if you were being real with yourself and you had to go and look at your bank statement, I think you would be, I think you would be overwhelmed with how accurate it would be to show you where your allegiance, where your heart really is. But on the flip side, one of my favorite things is when a person has the opportunity, it's often the first place that a follower expresses real allegiance to God. When a person takes those steps to walk and follow Jesus, and they really take that first step to give to what God is calling them to give to, to surrender and offer a gift that maybe is even sacrificial to what God is calling them to. It's often a place of real faith. And for some people, it's the first time they've ever experienced what it's really like to depend on God and to put yourself in a place where you have to trust him. And, it, and this really is a sign of true allegiance to him. You are on his team. You are invested in him. He and his, his goals, his, his vision, his kingdom matters to you. And you're willing to put your heart and your money in that place. So here's the question then. Why can we struggle or why, or when it comes to obedience, why why do we struggle with money? When it comes to obedience, why, why, why do we struggle with money? Why can we struggle with this? Like, I, all right, I get it. Like, I'm supposed to obey what God calls me to do. I want to do that. But, but then we get to the topic of money, and it's a struggle for most of us. Why is that something that seems to just, just be a difficult thing to turn, to be a difficult step to take, to be something that's hard to consistently do it? What is there? 
And what's crazy is if you read just a few verses later, in the same chapter, just starting in verse 25, it's like Jesus anticipates the question. It's like he goes, I know this is going to be a difficult thing. You're going to have to choose between two masters, between me and money. And he's not talking to a crowd of people that are rich beyond belief. He's not talking to the group of people like us that have a storage units full of extra things or closets that are overflowing or too many gifts to fit underneath the Christmas tree or too much food that they'll have leftovers at a meal in just a few days. He's not talking to that group. He's talking to a group of people that have nothing, that are trying to get to him so they will have a meal. He's talking to a group of people that don't have land. He's talking to a group of people that have no future wealth stored up, but yet he sees the temptation that even with a little This is a challenge to be obedient in this area. So what does he jump to? What does he go to? What is the catalyst for the struggle of obedience in this area? Listen to Jesus' words and see if you can't figure it out. That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whatever you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't it? Isn't life more than food, your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. Don't, don't, do, do they plant or harvest or store uh, foods in barns? For your, for your heavenly father feeds them, and aren't you more valuable to him than they are? Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? Man, that needs to be on my tongue more this time of year and this year. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. Don't they work? Do they work and make their clothing? Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not as dressed as beautiful as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? And again, this word little, it's, it's, it's not amount, it's length. It's length. It's not, it's not size of faith, it's, it's length. So don't worry about these things, saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. Dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow brings its own worries. That has like been the verse of the year, right? Don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow brings its own worries. And then it ends with today's trouble is enough for today. (laughs) I love the NLT's ending of that. So here's, I don't know if you caught it, but here's what Jesus is tying together. He's tying the idea, obedience with money and worry are often found in the same place. Obedience with your money and worry are often found in the same place. And in fact, he really does this. Worry and money are tied together. They're tied together. When you remove the security of your money, when you remove the the kind of control that money seems to give you, and then you put God, it, it puts you in a place where you naturally worry. It puts you in a place where you have to have faith. You have to trust in God. So here's the thought. Fear or worry can be a faith killer. You've experienced this before, right? You think you can do something. You get up there. You're going on the high dive at the pool, right? You're going on to to try out to do something. You're interviewing for the job, right? You are excited. You think you can nail it. And then you get in there and you just self-doubt and the fear creeps in and you start to go, I don't think I can. And your faith in yourself is eroded away. The same is with our faith with God. When we let worry dominate, it erodes the faith. But, but faith in God is a fear killer. That's what it is. When you put your faith in God, he is the biggest bully. He is the biggest, strongest bodyguard. He's the guy that steps behind you and says, I got your back. He's the one that pushes and shoves and does not move. He is the light to the darkness that is fear. And he does not step back. He does not back down. And he dominates and has victory over fear. 
Now, for some of us, that's really good news. <laughs> and I would tell you this, selfless faith in God gives fearlessly. Selfless faith in God gives fearlessly. It gives without a worry, without counting it, without worrying about what it'll cost or what it could be. It gives fearlessly with faith-filled belief in God. And in fact, I think true generosity is fearless. True generosity is a fearless act. When you give and it's so much, when you give and it's more than, than you feel comfortable, when you give and it's, it's really hard, that is a fearless act. It really is. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Jesus watching someone give in the temple, uh, actually watching a few people and then watching one specific person give, made this observation to his disciples, talking about a fearless faith-filled giver. In Luke chapter 21, we get this in verses 1 through 4. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched the rich people dropping their gifts in the collection box. Then a poor widow who is seen as property and women in the country cannot own or, or will never own any property or land or any future wealth. So they are literally unable most of the time to hold any kind of real job and they are unable to build wealth or have a real home. And she's a widow and her man evidently is gone. She is in desperate need. And yet here is what she does. She comes by and drops two small coins. And Jesus sees this and he goes, that's it. Did you see her heart? I tell you the truth, Jesus said, this poor widow has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given everything she has. Fearless generosity, giving all that she has. Faith-filled, fearless generosity. To give out of faith will bring a little fear. To give out of faith will bring a little fear, but the fear, is, the fear in giving should excite you for the opportunity to express real faith. The fear that comes with that, with that real faith-filled giving, it should excite you for the opportunity to go, yes, I am in it now. I am actually showing my allegiance. I am actually having the opportunity to prove whose side I'm on, to prove who I line up to, to prove that my heart is going away from this and attaching to the real God, to real faith in a Savior. And I would challenge you to get a plan. <laughs> How do we do this then? If this is what we need to do, we need to put ourselves where we give and we have a chance to see our real faith moment where our hearts detach from money and attach to our Savior, move from the master of money to the master who is a loving God who cares for us, that we can count on. How do we do this? How do we do it? I want to give you four quick pointers. You ready? The first, have a plan to give. Budget a percentage of income and give it away first. This is so key. Faith-filled giving is not a tip. Faith-filled giving gives first and has a plan to do it. It is something they say, yes, and I'm in. And I've seen the best way to do it is a percentage. It's a percentage. And I know for some of you, you're like, are you talking about the tithe? And I'm like, yes, partially I am. I am talking about a tithe. I, I think consistency, which is going to be the next thing on this list, is important. But what I find in the tithe is the, it, the principle of the percentage is the guiding part of the faith-filled giving plan. Because if you make extra in the month, that percentage calls you to have faith to step up in your percentage giving. But if you make less, it's okay to give the percentage you pre-decided. You don't have to feel guilty because the amount goes down a little. You pre-decided and you are following God. And the amount, whether it's two small coins or large rich donations, the heart is what Jesus is after. And this percentage and giving first is the way to get your heart off and into faith. And I think that's really, really important. The second thing that I would tell you is consistency is very important. Do it often and on purpose. 
Uh, the way that you can just kind of trick yourself in, like, like, like Jesus says, like, if you think you see light, but it's actually darkness, you're in real darkness. This often is what happens. People give every so often, but they don't do it on purpose, and they kind of inoculate themselves. They give themselves just enough of a pat on the back to never really truly put their allegiance to God, to never truly put their allegiance in his camp and to say they're in. If you do it consistently on purpose, it proves it. It becomes a muscle. It becomes something you trust in more and more to do. The third thing is this. Do not try and control all the outcomes. Let the gift be an act of faith. This is so important. I know as Americans, because we have the opportunity to give a ton, it is tempting to only give to the places where we can control and know that every penny that we gave is being responsibly held and done. And I'm not telling you to give irresponsibly. I'm just telling you the point of this is not for you to manage every gift perfectly. The point of this is to remove your heart and to put God and his heart in you, to remove this heart of money, this desire, this evil thing that gets inside of you, to get that out. And by removing that and putting God in control, you are trusting and you are giving not to control more outcomes, but to change your heart. And that would be what, what flows into the last thing here. And that is this, do not, try, do not, do not see effectiveness as the only criteria. Don't see that if you give a gift and it doesn't really seem to make an impact, you're like, well, that was worthless. And I would just say that's just not true. You are not God, and he has plans that you do not see. And I would tell you that your heart and inside you is the thing that he cares about most. Yes, he's going to use that money. Yes, he's going to do great things with what you are giving and donating to his kingdom and to better the people that he loves. But he is also concerned and working in the background of a lot of different people's lives. It may be someone that watches you give that is changed by it. It may be your heart that he actually cares about. And the donation is just an opportunity for you as much as it is for the cause that you're fighting for. It's very, very important. So get a plan. Do it consistently. Don't try to control it. Don't worry if it's not perfectly effective. God is working through it. So to wrap this all up, I want you to bring the light. Give generously and fearlessly. As a church, I have never been more proud of 2020. The consistency that we have had and the people that call this their church home to continue to give through this year has been inspiring and amazing. Even though at times we are not together in person, you see the value and what we are offering to our community, to the world, and you see the value of your faith in real steps. And I want to say thank you. And even this campaign that we're in right now, this Bring the Light Action Plan, I am loving that you guys are so invested, even though we're not together. The donations were at the door the moment that campaign started last week. I mean, that night we had diapers being dropped off. That night we had donations rolling in. And I'm just proud of, I'm proud of you. However, I want this to be something that doesn't just start and, and end in a month. I want this to be something that continues to be something that you're working into your life, that you're taking real steps to detach yourself from this thing that can corrupt your heart and lead you away from real faith. I want you to come back, attach your heart to the one that loves you most, who wants the best for you, has the best plans. And if you somehow think that I am trying to get King's Way more money and that that's, this whole sermon's about me teaching you to give to King's Way, uh, listen to me now. Do not give to King's Way if you think that's the motivation, but do give somewhere. Find a place to give a percentage consistently without trying to control the outcome and to see the effectiveness, not just in what you gave as the number one thing that Jesus is concerned about. Find a place to do that. But if you do feel like Kingsway is worth investing in, we'd love, we'd love for you to join in the faith journey of finding full life and inviting all that we can and all that we are around us into that journey as well. You guys, bring the light. Give generously and fearlessly. If you want to know about this campaign and you've heard us talk about it, go to kingswaymo.com backslash bring the light. There are still plenty of ways to join in and to give. You guys have a great and glorious day in the Lord.
We'll see you later. <laughs>